Hello and welcome to this week's Sunday Short from the Newcastle West Methodist Circuit. Today, the 23rd of January, is the third Sunday after Epiphany. And I've chosen as my theme, One Vision. I'm still following song-related themes. How many know that One Vision is a song by Queen? Well, all will come clearer later, hopefully. The lectionary reading for today is Luke 4. 14 to 21. You know, it's amazing how quickly we are progressing through the story of Jesus. We've no sooner had Christmas and the visit of the wise men, then we're into his baptism, followed by his first miracle at the wedding in Cana. Now this week we are looking at the first words we hear of his public ministry in Luke's Gospel. It's sort of his inaugural address. He's returned to Nazareth, and as an honoured guest and someone who has gathered a reputation as a great teacher, he's invited to read the scriptures and give an interpretation. Now, what sort of image springs to mind when we read about Jesus standing up to read the scripture? I don't know about you, but my immediate thought is a tallish man standing at a pulpit or a lectern and addressing people seated in rows like in a church, but that's far from the reality. And the image of Jesus is probably something like this classic painting Salvatore Mundi by Leonardo da Vinci. That again is probably far from reality. It's a westernised image of Jesus. Scholars suggest that Jesus was probably biologically closer to Iraqi Jews than any other current population. He was probably around, I don't know, five foot five inches tall and likely had short hair and a beard in accordance with Jewish practice of the time. Context is important. Let me just illustrate this a bit. When I was working for the HIV charity Mardme, we had work in Africa, predominantly Kenya and Uganda. These I visited many times. In Uganda we had a day clinic employing around 200 people. Every morning would start with prayers and some would, would give a short address. I was asked to do this <laughs> and it was quite tricky. Many of the illustrations I would normally use here just wouldn't work as it would not be at all familiar to African culture. And words would have to be changed as they would use something totally different. For example, potatoes were called Irish, a peanut is a g-nut, and a motorcycle is a boda boda. So if you use the word motorcycle, they wouldn't understand what it meant. So I had to think very carefully about what to say and make sure it's culturally relevant and using words they would understand. Now that is some of the problems we face when listening to our Bible readings. How would what Jesus says come across to a first century Jew? To help us to give today's reading a little more context, I'm going to show a video of it which will help us understand the context a little bit more and just how this might have happened. So let's watch this video now. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Then, he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. 
The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So, let's try and think of ourselves as those first people listening to Jesus in the synagogue. He's reading a passage from Isaiah and concludes with the words, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. What would they make of that? The Isaiah reading says, He has chosen me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed. Now, we listen to that with benefit of hindsight. We know who Jesus is. We understand he's the Messiah, fulfilling the prophecy. But what if we were in the audience when Jesus spoke all those years ago? How would we understand what had just happened? Jesus then sits down, which is the usual posture for a teacher, and said, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. What does that mean? This is a local lad, a teacher of some renown, but nonetheless a son of a carpenter. So what is he saying? Is he saying that all criminals will be released? Anyone who cannot see will get their sight back? The poor will get rich? On the face of it, this seems to be what he's proclaimed. But again, we are not looking at it like a first century Israelite, listening to the scripture in a synagogue. They would have been well versed in scripture, know Isaiah and understand when it was written and who it was written for. Isaiah 61 was written after the people had returned from exile in Babylon. The mourning in this part of Isaiah arises out of frustration and humiliation over the failure to rebuild the city and the temple to match its former glory and the failure to reconcile the different factions within the city. The reality of life was nothing like the expectations for a restored Jerusalem that those returning from exile had imagined. The Isaiah scripture is about coming back, coming out of exile, back to God. The trouble is that 500 years on, the people still hadn't really come back to God. Now, in a way, they were still in exile. And Jesus is effectively saying, I am your rescue from exile. I am the way back to God. The word translated poor has to do with economic status as well as other factors that lowered your status. Things like gender, education, occupation disability, etc. These are the oppressed, relegated to the margins of society. That's not what God wants. The blind are those who are close to God. Captive, similarly, those captured by something which separates them from God. Let's think about that. Jesus declares that he himself will be the fulfilment of this prophecy. In the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus is the one who has been chosen to preach and proclaim the good news of God. This takes place 2,000 years ago. Then the people were separated from God, and Jesus was to be the one to change all that. But what does that mean for us today? A recent survey showed that overall, only 27% of people in the UK believe in God. 35% of people in Britain say they belong to a Christian denomination, but incredibly, only 56% of those believe in God. We are living in an age which is definitely not Christian, and by and large, godless. Now, I believe this affects society. It seems much less tolerant. There is an increased abuse, much of it posted on social media. You get racist and bigoted comments which are hurtful and damaging. And society has come, become all about me. What I want, what I need. People are blind, captives, poor, 
once more. And I think this has a knock-on effect into the church, which reflects some of these attitudes. Church tends to become me-centred. What I want. Worship becomes consumer-focused. What I get from it, not what I can give to God. There are similarities today with the people of Israel at the time of Jesus. And, I dare say, with those at the time of Isaiah. We have lost vision. Proverbs 29 verse 18 says this, Where there is no vision, the people perish. Now that brings me back to my song, One Vision. Now, here it goes, I could play a bit of a queen here. I know many of you love to sing along with these videos. So, would you enjoy singing along to Queen? <laughs> okay. Maybe not. I won't play it. But let's just look at the words. One man, one goal, one mission. One heart, one soul, just one solution. One flash of light, one God, one vision. There is only one solution to the problems of the day. And this song sums up where we need to be, having one vision focused on God, the God that Jesus showed us, a God who wants justice, fairness, equality for all. Where are we in that vision? Going back to my statistics, only one in five Christians say religion is very important in their lives. Nearly half say that their faith, their religion, is not important. That means there isn't the focus on, the, on God that we might expect. So what does that say about the church? About us? How important is our faith to us? One of my neighbours cleans his car on a Sunday. Every week without fail. It's his routine. I go to church on a Sunday. Is it the same? Is it a habit, a routine? Something I do on a Sunday? When I was growing up, we did not have a television until about 1954. And we could only watch BBC. The second channel's ITV was introduced in 1955, and sets had to be adapted to receive it. Only seven and three quarter hours of broadcast was allowed on a Sunday. And another anachronism reigned. Television shown between 2pm and 4pm was intended for adults children were meant to be in Sunday school. Here is a typical Sunday from the Radio Times of January 1955. Programme started at 2.30pm and finished at 10.45pm. Sundays were boring, no TV to watch, so going to church on a Sunday, or maybe Sunday school if you were a child, passed the time. It's possible we created a habit out of church going because that was something to do on a Sunday. Do I go out of habit? I don't think so, and I certainly don't hope so. I go because my faith is important, because I want to worship God. So how about you? Is your church going a habit? Something you do because it's Sunday? Is watching videos like this something to pass the time on a Sunday? Or is it important because your faith is important? Let's just recap on the passage from Luke, and in particular the scripture that Jesus reads from Isaiah. This reflects the fact that the return from exile did not work out as expected. Jerusalem and the temple did not return to their former glory. There were inequalities and religious and political factions within the city. The reality of life in Jerusalem was nothing like the expectations as proclaimed by the prophets. Now right here, at the beginning of his ministry, Jesus tells us clearly what his mission is about. He boldly claims to fulfil the words of Isaiah, speaking of the Spirit anointing him, sending him, compelling him to bring good news to every one of God's children who is captive, impoverished, 
unable to see and desperately hungry for good news. Now it would be easy to spiritualise this. Make it about the poor in spirit, etc. Now that's one way of looking at it. But at the same time, and in line with Jesus' own preaching of the text, we can understand that these words speak not only of spiritual, but of physical realities. To the brokenness of the world. These are people who are so often outside the congregation, the denomination and the church. The words of restoration, which are followed by Jesus' ministry to the broken, are to restore the nation and bring the good news of reconciliation. These words of restoration, which are followed by Jesus' ministry to the broken, are to restore the nation and bring the good news of reconciliation to all people. Wait just a moment. If we read on in Luke 4, we find at first the people were impressed with him. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. But then, and this is a big but, when the people hear the further words of Jesus in verses 23 to 27, this approval evaporates. We read in verses 28 and 29, all the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up and drove him out of the town. They could not comprehend the vision of this God-centred society. Reconciliation and restoration were okay, provided it didn't affect them. They probably wanted their own version of the vision, something that was not quite so challenging, something that reinforced the status quo but did not upset it. Similarly, today, we tend to reject the hard message and look for something less challenging. I'm not saying the churches have lost God, just lost focus, lost the passion, lost the one vision. The song, One Vision, written and recorded by Queen, was conceived by the group's drummer, Roger Taylor. The song was inspired by the life and exploits of Martin Luther King, Jr., with the lyrics recounting a man battling and overcoming the odds. It's about a better and fairer world. No wrong, no right. I'm going to tell you there's no black and no white. No blood, no stain. All we need is one worldwide vision. One vision. So give me your hands. Give me your hearts. I'm ready. There's only one direction. One world and one nation. Yeah, one vision. No colour prejudice, no war, no injustice, just one worldwide vision. And that's the message Jesus brings in this inaugural address in Nazareth. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has chosen me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, and announce that the time has come when the Lord will save his people. If we are to be true followers of Jesus, where church and faith are of paramount importance, then we need to make this our manifesto as well. It can be a hard message. Listen to this reading from James 2. Dear friends, do you think you'll get anywhere in this if you learn all the right words but never do anything? Does merely talking about faith indicate that a person really has it? For instance, you come upon an old friend dressed in rags and half starved and say, Good morning, friend. Be clothed in Christ. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. And walk off without providing so much as a coat or a cup of soup. Where does that get you? Isn't it obvious that God talks without like God acts is outrageous nonsense? As we begin to emerge from the coronavirus pandemic, the world will be different, church will be different. We will not and cannot go back to the past. There will be new challenges, new ways of doing things. But God will not be different. Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever. The message of reconciliation does not change. Society needs this, faith in action, 
and I believe it will be a time when the church discovers some of its purpose. To bring about good news to those who need it. And it's for each one of us to seek to help to bring about a change, a renewed purpose. One God, one vision. Where do you stand in this? What is your vision? How will you be part of the mission of God? We come now to a time of prayer. This is the week of prayer for Christian unity and our reading reminded us of the differences in worship around the world. But we all worship the one God. So let us come in prayer with faith and confidence before our God who is Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Let us pray. God of all creation, we pray today for Christian communities around the world in the diversity of worship and tradition. Lord, we ask you to preserve these, particularly in areas of the world where the presence and survival of the church is threatened by violence and oppression. Jesus brought good news for all, yet too often we can find this message. Forgive us, Lord, when we have acted unwisely, not respected different cultures, different backgrounds, when we have acted unjustly, shown discrimination, and failed you and your mission. Lord, give us humility and the vision to see the world as you see it, to be focused on you and on your mission. May the light of Christ be our vision. Heavenly Father, give us wisdom to know what you would have us do and the discernment to know what is your desire for our lives, so that we may align our thoughts to your thoughts and our will to your perfect will and purpose. Keep us from following our own ways and being influenced by the ways of the world, but rather that we may be ready to follow your guidance and direction. Forgive us for seeking to place our trust in our own limited view of what we consider is important in our lives and in the world in which we live. Rather than seeking your vision for the world, teach us to learn your vision, your will, not only in our personal lives and in those of our loved ones, but also help us to come to a deeper knowledge of your greater vision for the future of this world. Help us to see your greater purpose for for humanity and help us to make that our goal. Lord Jesus Christ, send us out with confidence in your word to tell the world of your saving acts and bring glory to your name. Let us now join in the Lord's Prayer in its modern form. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. And finally, the grace. Share in this if you wish. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and evermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve.